just want to start by uh, acknowledging Colorado College. Would like to acknowledge that this um, it is located within the stolen territory of the Ute peoples. The earliest documented peoples also include the Apache, Arapaho, Comanche, and Cheyenne. And our region continues to be home to many thriving indigenous communities. Um, we are here tonight to celebrate the Fine Arts Center's exhibition, Ronnie Cabedo at the Line. Want to give a quick shout out and thanks to um, all of the FAC Museum uh, staff and the event staff who made this possible, uh, both this event and the exhibition. A uh, special thanks to Michael Cristiano, director of the museum and executive director um, Idris Goodwin, amongst all of the many people who are involved with this exhibition. Want to also give a thanks to our private lenders who let works to the show. Um, and of course, uh, most first and foremost to the artist, Ronnie Cavedo, for um, taking the time to, to be in conversation with us and sharing his work. So thank you for, for being here tonight. Um, I'm gonna start the, the conversation um, by just introducing all of our uh, honored and distinguished panelists who, who've taken time to be with us here tonight. Um, and then we'll uh, hear from all of them about their, their work and then um, have, a, have a conversation and open it up to you all for questions for um, all of our panelists. So I'll start um, with Ronnie Cavedo um, to my right, uh, who works in a variety of mediums, including sculpture and drawing. He received his MFA from Yale University and a BFA from Cooper Union. Uh, Ronnie has been exhibited at the Denver Art Museum, which we'll talk about um, shortly, the Albright Knox Gallery, um, Up For Gallery, James Fuentes Gallery, and the Whitney Museum uh, of American Art, as well as, the, as the, well as the Queens Museum. His work has been reviewed in Art Forum and Hyperallergic, and is held in the permanent collections of the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Denver Art Museum, and most recently, the Fine Arts Center um, at Colorado College. Uh, his work is highlighted in Latinx art, artist markets politics, markets politics by Arlene Davila. He's a recipient of a Jerome Hill Artist Fellowship and a Blade Brass Fellowship for Socially Engaged Art, and a 2021 recipient of the Joan Mitchell Foundation. Uh, he has held residencies at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, Project Row Houses, and Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture. Um, next is Victoria Liao, the Frederick and Jan Mayer Curator of Art of the Ancient Americas at the Denver Art Museum. Uh, she has received her PhD in pre-Columbian art history from UCLA, a master's in art history from Tulane University, and her bachelor's in anthropology and history of art from Yale University. Her academic interests and research focus on narrativity and bilingualism in Maya mural painting. Victoria worked as a curator at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art um, of the Ancient Americas for 10 years before joining San Francisco State University's Museum Studies Program as an associate professor. She joined the Denver Art Museum in 2017. In addition to co-curating with Jorge Rivas the exhibition Revisión Art of the Americas, she's also working on an NEH-funded exhibition, Trader, Survivor, Icon, The Legacy of La Malinche, which will open in February of 2022 and travel on to Albuquerque and San Antonio. And finally, we have uh, Jorge Rivas Perez, uh, who is an art historian, architect, and industrial designer, and the Frederick and Jan Mayer Curator of Latin American Art at the Denver Art Museum, and former curator of Spanish colonial art, the Colección Patricia Fev Cisneros, he earned his architecture degree at the Universidad Central de Venezuela and his PhD in art history from the Bard Graduate Center in New York. He's written extensively and has curated many exhibitions on Spanish colonial art and Latin American design of the 20th century. And I've asked uh, Jorge and uh, Victoria to share a little bit about their work um, uh, of their exhibition, Revisión, which is currently on view at the Denver Art Museum. And I would highly encourage you all, if you haven't seen it yet, to check it out. It's, it's a, a really fantastic, smart um, installation and exhibition. And it features Ronnie's work within that installation. Um, so I've asked them to just chat a little bit about that and, and um, share with us their work. 
So I'm, I'm giving the mic over <laughs> to, to you all. Well, thank you so much, Katya, for the very kind invitation. And we both think that you are incredibly lucky to have both Katya and your new director here. Um, it's wonderful to be invited um, by these new colleagues. So Jorge and I, um, we worked on Revision, a new look at art in the Americas for about three and a half, four years. Is that right? We were asked initially to do it, the history behind this um, mashup, if you will, of ancient Spanish colonial and contemporary work was a way to bring together these two extraordinary collections that we're very um, grateful to have in Denver. As many of you know, we have a really extraordinary collection of Spanish colonial art. Um, it's the best in the country and a really extraordinary collection of ancient American art. They've shared a floor for a long time, but our visitor panels often show that they, our, our visitors did not understand that they shared the same geographic origin, right? It was the same landmass and many of the same people that were producing this work but when they walked into one space, they thought it was unconnected or disconnected. So how could we bring these two collections in conversation and make them relevant to today, right? Um, so we, I think, worked very hard and we asked our advisors because neither of us are specialists in contemporary art, to be honest. Um, we pulled together a group of three advisors to help talk us through this crazy mashup and how we could bring together some themes and some stories that were relevant um, and very positive about the Americas. We felt like the story about the importance of the conquest, you know, we often divide our collections as pre-arrival of Europeans and post, but many of us feel like we are the product of both, right? of both sides of that coin. And how, how can we make that into something generative and, and not focus on the destruction? Not to disavow the destruction, but to really think like, look, there's been a whole region that has come from this, from this moment and this encounter and continues to be relevant today and is inspiring artists like Ronnie today. Yes, uh, we, when we started this project, uh, we're thinking, what is the Americas? What is this? We are there, so we know something, um, particularly, you know, Victoria and I, that we have these roots in Latin America, and, uh, and we represent somehow what is America's in the United States? I'm an immigrant, and Victoria is, uh, is of Hispanic heritage. So we were thinking, what is really, what is the Americas for this country? And how we can translate that experience and somehow this personal tools into an exhibition and uh, tell this narrative using the collection that we have, that Victoria said is extraordinary collection. And we were kind of, uh, you know, a little bit trying to figure out how to deal with that. And, um, and we realized that we need contemporary art. Because artists like Ronnie, they somehow are very good in translating this process of understanding who are you where are you living? And how can you contribute to this dimension? And this is the idea of the exhibition. We have these contemporary pieces like his work that showcases where is America's today. And we have the roots of that kind of work. And uh, once we had this clear idea, we were, it was relatively easy. We have fantastic colleagues, uh, you know, the curator of Beverly Adams from the Museum of Modern Art. 
Julieta Gonzalez at that time, she was the director of the Museo of Humex in Mexico City, and Elena Stromberg, uh, uh, professor, professor at the university. university. Yeah. So um, we started trying to find those core elements that make the continent unique. And probably, Victoria, you, you can talk a little bit of this entry yeah. section. So brief overview of the exhibition, we, when we came up with this question of what is the Americas today, what makes the Americas the Americas, we came up with this idea that we were going to start with the land. The idea that land is paramount and that you are rooted in place, and that is, is such a defining aspect. Um, so the, the opening of the show you see here is a Marajoara urn. Uh, this is you know, circa around 800 CE, somewhere between 500 and 800 CE, from this very large island in the delta of the Amazon where the river dumps into the Atlantic Ocean. And the piece behind it is actually about the Amazon River and about an area um, in the middle of the Amazon jungle, Manaus. And Jorge and I thought, okay, if we're gonna make something new, let's also kind of destabilize what we often see as the two poles of the Americas, Mexico and Peru. So we began instead with Brazil. And the, um, this piece and what you don't see is a, a work, a series by an indigenous artist that Jorge recently acquired. He's, uh, his name is Shironawe Hakihiwe, and he lives at the other extreme of the Venezuelan Amazon. And why the Amazon? Because it's the region that is still more or less intact. It's the very core of the continent. It's the soul of the Americas. And uh, the whole exhibition is designed around that idea that you're in, deep in the jungle. And if you have been in the jungle, you see that you, you move your head up and you see the sky, the birds, all these animals with bright colors, this dark background. And this was the idea that we gave to the designers for the show. This is where you see these jewel like colors where the objects are. So this, this beginning section, it really thinks about what are the, the parts of the land that define a community's identity. Um, so corn in Mesoamerica, for example, the origin story is that we are the people of corn. Um, and then the volcanoes, the topography, the mountains, um, the, the landscape that you see, the horizons that you see and how the rumble of the earth beneath you impacts how you think about your worldview. And as you move through the space, you then think about the riches that the land gave you. And we, we have a section really, oh, this is a work by Carla Fernandez and Pedro Reyes. They're a husband and wife team from Mexico. And they created this map um, for us. It was a commission. It's an embroidered map of North, Central, and South America in which the names of the indigenous communities that inhabited this space for the last 11,000 years make the shape of the continents. And it was embroidered by five Otomi women. The leader was named Andy Lopez, and she oversaw its construction. They made the map in protest to the rhetoric that was being done in 2018 around the US-Mexico border and the detention of children. And they wanted just to make very clear that all of us in some way or another are immigrants to this land. Well, I think that this is not, you know, that's probably my fault. I, this morning I <laughs> put a lot of photos and I gave to uh, email them. Uh, but um, I think that uh, one of the most remarkable aspects of the exhibition is that uh, uh, we really collapsed time and geography. So it's full of surprises because uh, unless you're a specialist, you don't know exactly if you don't read the label what you're dealing with. And it was intentional. Because for example, uh, in this section, you can see art in the, in the wall from different periods. You have the, the, the first this kind of 
half of view that you see of the Cathedral of Mexico City uh, for photograph of uh, Bedoya, the Peruvian photographer, uh, Torres Garcia painting from the 1930s, a contemporary artwork, a video, a colonial painting, and, and two uh, ancient Mexican uh, snake heads. So that gives you idea of this juxtaposition of elements. But there's a logic to it. So if you were standing between the two snake heads, what you would see immediately behind you is this beautiful painting by Gualdi of the main plaza in Mexico City. The, the subject itself is the cathedral. But if any of you have been there, off to the right of the cathedral, just behind it and to the right, is the Templo Mayor, the main pyramid of the Aztecs. And they considered this to be the navel, right, of their cosmos. It was the center of their world. And the balustrades, the staircases, would end in two serpent heads. So that's, you have, this section of the show is really thinking, we're moving beyond the land, and we're now thinking about how we order the land and how we create borders and boundaries and the creation of cities. And eventually it leads us into a discussion of the border. Um, and so the video that you see there is actually a video game that was created um, by a local artist who teaches at DU. His name is Rafael Fajardo, and he used to teach in El Paso and grew up in Texas actually, but he's from Colombia. And he made that video in about 2000 when there was a, a lot of um, rhetoric at the border and there was a lot a big interest in immigration. And he made it based on the video game Frogger and he kept the retro aesthetics. So it's actually really hard to play um, because there's a time lag between you pressing the button and the, and the movement of the characters and all the characters are based on peanuts. So the main protagonist, Carlitos Moreno, is Charlie Brown. And he's trying to get to the US so he can get his visa. But there's all of these different obstacles that he must cross. And there's a mirror game called La Migra, where you're an ICE officer. And, and it's interesting, the choices that Rafael made. As an ICE officer, if somebody dies on your watch, the corpse stays in the video game and never disappears. So you're confronted with that result. And, and I think it's important if we can advance to, to see Ronnie Quevedo's work, the center of this conversation, that, that corner, exactly. Because that's, that was, that's behind the, the snake heads. And uh, perhaps you wanna talk about this corner that you created with this extraordinary chuku piece? So um, this piece that Ronnie created called the uh, Los Desaparecidos, the Arbiter of Time, has, as many, will, many of you will see in the gallery in the exhibition upstairs, uh, these uh, patterns. It's the pattern of a shirt, right? And in the center, you see these lines that are um, coming out from the center space very much like a kipu. So you see an ancient example in this case um, at a 30 degree angle. It's a series of knotted cords that were used by the ancient Incas to keep track of their empire. Their empire was enormous. It went all the way from Ecuador, from Quito, down to Chile. It spanned thousands of miles and they kept very careful track of taxes and tributes that were owed by all the provinces to Cusco, the capital, via the system of knots. And we just thought about, you know, migration, the movement of people over time, and, and Ronnie's use of the quipo in the center of, of that piece was so compelling for that reason. And the fact that it's also alludes to the disappearance, you know, on so many different levels, but the disappearance of bodies, right? Um, that sometimes happens as a result of migration or of very severe governments. Um, it just felt like a very compelling comparison to us. Um, so that's 
I think Ronnie is one of a number of artists, and I think Katya and I have talked about it in the past, that are really looking at a deeper level to answer questions of identity, but looking at the past and seeing a relationship to their very existence today. I don't know if you want to yeah, talk about yeah, it. Ronnie, Ronnie uh, today we were talking formally, and uh, he mentioned uh, that it was a big surprise when he saw the show for the first time to see a real example of the Kipu knot. Uh, I don't know if you want to expand on that, Ronnie. Yeah, I mean, for me, I've been operating, um, looking at these artifacts through images and through what is available within you know, local museums and to kind of see my work, the connection and conversation with an actual people was really profound. Like for me, it was like this, uh, how else can you kind of illustrate this collapsing of time, right? And um, looking at what the artifact has meant to me as a symbol of fragmentation, the symbol of, um, of a past that is known and yet unknown, you know, cause for me, it was really, really important, especially my development as an artist, when a lot of the questions of like, how, what is the context for this work? How do, how do we know this information? And realizing that a lot of it is just based on deduction. It's really based on kind of these really educated guesses. And in some cases, there's that um, kind of missed opportunity to connect with that history. Um, so to see it in person, to kind of see the, the actual object in my kind of um, homage to it was really, really impressive to me. And I think um, biographically, the, the connection to, to this image being about my, both my parents, my mom, who's a seamstress, and my dad, who's a soccer player and a referee, was also, um, it, it, it just speaks to this lineage that is often um, put to the side. Right, it's often made invisible. It's often uh, given this kind of ancillary um, presentation, and so I've been really trying to be as mindful of it as possible to make sure that the the mapping and the the kind of um, lineage that they offer as a big part of my work. So. When I when I got to see it, it just made um, a lot of things like very visceral for me. Yeah, and, and I think this is very important because uh, when we were organizing the show, we were really thinking history always is you know marked with this moment of change of rupture, which are very specific and precise. But we want to deal with the long lines of continu continuity. Mm -hmm. We wanna deal with those things that have been keep going on and they trespass those difficult moments. And that's the idea of the show, to showcase those uh, really continuous movements of ideas and, and, and art, because it's at the very end, this is about human creation and, and, and and creativity and uh, expression. And uh, this is why it works like Ronnie were key to articulate the exhibition because uh, one of the, you know, I, I oversee a historical college and I struggle to get uh, my visitors to the museum uh, to connect with this art from the past because the context is different. But the threads, that remain, uh, you know, touched. Those are key for me to connect with the visitors, and this is our idea of the, of the exhibition and selecting artists like Ronnie. Yeah, and I think it's also important that you, you're talking about it in terms of art and art making, because oftentimes, when at least when I was coming up and learning about the kipu and and a lot of the stone sculptures, they always tend to fall into archaeology, anthropology, you know, these spaces that are not about um, art making necessarily. So for me, that was also been a really key part to make sure that the 
the lens of the things that I'm interested in go beyond the conquest, right? They, they extend into the, that lineage that you're talking about. Yeah. Should we go into the exhibition? Yeah, let's let's talk about your show here at the Planetia. Let me just we'll have a quick walkthrough of the Denver Art Museum. <laughs> really quick. And if you all have any other thoughts as we scroll through this. This is this is something to get you to the Denver Museum mm -hmm. the purpose. The the piece in the back with the helicopters is actually a, it's a really interesting one. It's a an artist from Los Angeles, her name is Sandy Rodriguez, and she has been working on papel amate, which is like a mulberry bark paper that would have been used by pre-Columbian scribes um, to make maps. And she, like them, will collect plants and herbs and distill them to make her own pigments. But the map itself, um, it shows the western half of the United States, all of the states that previously were part of Mexico prior to the 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe, when Mexico um, gave that territory to the United States. And in, in all of her imagery, what she's done is she has um, referenced the Florentine Codex, which is a 16th century sort of visual encyclopedia of Aztec thought and culture. And she has imagery of both women and children. And much like Carla and Pedro, she made this map in 2018 in protest to the child detention centers. So she located those detention centers where they were in El Paso and um, trying to bring sort of the irony, right, of this fact that these individuals were being imprisoned in a territory that had formerly belonged to their country, right? But she also includes off the coast of Galveston, a ship that forcibly repatriated um, uh, Mexican Americans. So people that were US citizens of Mexican descent back to Mexico in the 1940s and 50s. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting map because much like Ronnie's work, she's layering time and history, geography and questions of her own identity. She grew up between Tijuana and San Diego. Um, so she also feels like the border for her was fluid. And why isn't it anymore? Yeah, so maybe we can start talking about your exhibition here. And I think you all are hitting on some of the the really key parts of, of Ronnie's work um, and the reason I was so keen on bringing him to Colorado Springs when I started here and um, was especially intrigued about uh, Ronnie's work thinking about both his uh, family heritage, but also a lar larger cultural heritage and how that functions in the present. Um, so I thought that was really a really compelling practice. So we invited him to, um, come think about our space and, and the conversations resulted in um, at the line, which includes new and existing works. Um, so Ronnie, if you just want to chat for a minute yeah. about um, the works that are included here. Yeah, and I think for those of you who have been able to see the work in person, this is kind of what you're greeted with um, if you're coming from the first gallery. And the title of the show at the line comes from you know, uh, the, this term of when a basketball player is moving uh, to the foul, um, to shoot a free throw. And um, the, this kind of, I've been really, really interested in how some sports terms can be quite poetic and talk about the, the, the idea of margins and the idea of boundaries, especially. And so one way that I was able to kind of respond to this space was we had access to this, um, this basketball court that was used by a basketball team in, in Portland, both the Trailblazer, Trailblazers and the Portland Fire. So I was really um, excited about that and being able to produce a, a new site-specific piece 
that responded to the architecture and a lot of the ideas that we were thinking about in the show. And what I did was to kind of um, solely focus on this, the, the, the place, the free throw line, the idea of, the, of being in the paint when the basketball player is about to uh, shoot a free throw. And so it was kind of thinking about one, kind of isolating the player and this position of self when dealing with a lot of um, moments of, of, of challenge, moments of contemplation, moments of kind of deliberating what one's identity is. And so my connection to the role of the player um, in this case um, is also connected to, you know, the idea of like the, uh, taking a penalty, um, taking a free throw, the moment in which the one player is really isolated and they have to show their skill. And my connection to sports is really thinking about my dad's history as a soccer player and then as a referee um, here in New York. He was a professional soccer player in Ecuador. And when we moved to the States, he, um, while working a factory job, he did a lot of uh, refereeing as an amateur uh, referee for both indoor soccer teams and outdoor soccer teams. And so my upbringing was really kind of going to um, these spaces, especially when I got to go to the gym and it was like a junior high school and the basketball court was open to anybody who, who wanted to play. And so it was like a league that actually an uncle of mine was organizing. My dad was a referee and you can kind of like, people would be drinking beer, they would be having food, but it was like a full fledged league. And so for me, my connection to sports was really about developing culture, developing one sense of agency, um, kind of on the, on, on the margins in a way, right? And so that upbringing of sport was more about convening and establishing space for oneself, not necessarily the heroism that's often kind of championed in, in, in a lot of like the mass consumption of, of sports. So the, the gymnasium floor pieces are, are really very much about that and that history and that upbringing, especially in New York. Um, so if we can go on to the, the, the next image, this is what the piece looks like from above. And I'm always really interested in presenting these objects from above um, because there's, so, there's a lot of things. There's like this connection to mapping. Um, I, over time, I've been really interested in about their connection to Nazca lines. Um, and also this representation of a, of a game that is both in kind of deconstruction and reconstruction. And so I'm also looking at these as almost drawings that are sculptural and sculptures that are uh, informed by drawing. So um, the other aspect of it is these milk crate pieces that I've uh, developed in 2012 and they've been slowly transforming over time. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, this kind of conflation of space and time. So in New York and in a lot of urban uh, places, the milk crate has kind of been reappropriated and turned into a basketball hoop. And growing up with that, that's always been really fascinating to me how reappropriation and transformation of an object is a way of establishing agency, is a way of establishing one's identity, one's kind of place. Um, in a city or in a location that almost is potentially unwelcoming to you. So I was taking that idea of the milk crate and connecting it to the stone hoop um, design of Olama, which is a precursor to, to soccer. And so for me, it was um, really finding a way to connect uh, these two places that I know are part of my lineage and creating something completely new. And so um, this piece here uh, is stemming from that kind of process of, of thinking of multiple histories, multiple places and times uh, for me. And yeah. Um, 
So on the other side of the, in the other gallery, I think Gandhi and I were really conscious of wanting to um, present two, two modes of, of moving within the space. And in one side, it was really just having people walk in the, in the gym floor, um, understanding that you can walk on it. And then there's this connection to mapping to the drawings on the wall, but also the works, the work on the floor. And then in the other space, I think it was a much more conscious decision to really emphasize the works on muslin and the things that have a lot more to do with um, the body and thinking about my mom's history as a seamstress as well. So what you see here <clears throat> is one piece that was created for the show specifically. So I do consider it more site-specific drawing in a way um, that we, I took into consideration the height of the ceiling and the way it would operate in this kind of sculptural way. So what I've been doing for these new drawings has been taking uh, pattern paper and cutting them into quarter inch strips and re-presenting them and rearranging them to create more abstract spaces. So uh, this one here is titled Myself When I Am Real. And it's, um, it's actually a title after uh, an improvisational piano piece by Charles Mingus. And for me, the title is kind of extending that idea of being at the line, the individual, what does one see when confronted with themselves? And so the title was really um, significant to me. Can we go to the next image? Um, yeah, we can talk about the people. Um, this piece, I, I wanted to present this piece. It's, it's, it's um, another iteration of the people. And I think for me, one um, aspect of my process is iteration and repeating. And like repetition is a really big component of the work. And it's also another way of processing what these artifacts mean to me. And so they often function on paper, they often function as, as drawings. And what I've been really interested in <clears throat> is how these objects are functioning architecturally. And so what I've been doing for a long time is using contact paper, almost as if I was applying uh, wood onto paper. So potentially like the drawing could be scaled up and recreate it as an actual floor. And so for this one, the people, while it functions as this design, it's also a sculptural object. It's like an architectural object. So if I were to, at some point, take this drawing and turn it into an actual floor sculpture that one can step onto. So again, these artifacts that I, I, I've always been really interested in, how do I <clears throat> take them and try to transform them so that they inform, <coughs> excuse me, how they inform other things rather than just like reify this notion of, of an ancient past or a uh, history that no longer exists because that's not really what I'm interested in. I really trying to figure out a way of mm, bringing them into, <coughs> into the present. <laughs> Can we go on to the next one? <clears throat> uh, so this idea of like repetition and iteration is something that I've been really interested in both as a concept, but also as a practice. And so what you see here are these three works, you can go to the next one, that um, are <clears throat> works on paper that are of the same mark done in one instance. And so what I've been doing is this, using this wax paper that comes from pattern making actually. And it's, it's a transfer paper. And I've been uh, 
using this method of transferring so I can create three drawings or four drawings simultaneously and then altering them so I can create a new iteration of that coming from this first mark. And so sorry, what you see here are the three versions of this um, indication of a of an Olympic stadium. So what you see are the you know standard design of the track and field and then the field in the center. And so again, these works on paper do function kind of as sketches for larger ideas in which potentially a Nazca line would be drawn into <clears throat> the center of an Olympic stadium. And in the other gallery, it really was to extend this idea of mapping a little bit further and also thinking about the body. And so what you see here are other versions that exist on Muslim that are also collaborations with my mother who does help me with making a lot of these. And so <clears throat> I was really interested in being able to present these as sculptural objects as well, in addition to textiles. So you'll, you'll notice that a lot of the work is on muslin and it's something that I'm really, really interested in to making sure that I'm kind of honoring this manual labor and all these objects or materials that are often considered to be um, disposable in a way. So, muslin considered being considered like a preparatory material and then the wax paper also something that you can just kind of throw away after you use it <clears throat> and what you see here these three pieces the one on the wall with the green and blue this metal one here and this other yellow piece over here um, are also coming from that process of uh, copying and transferring. And so what I've been doing as I scale these up is really thinking about the body a little bit more and how people respond to these in a very visceral way once they see them kind of encapsulating a more kind of human scale, like something that you could potentially wear or take off or carry with you. And so that's something that we were really conscious of when we were displaying the, when we were designing the space so that people can kind of walk around them and each one having their own, um, yeah, I guess space in a way, yeah. And yeah, I guess we'll end on, on this piece here. <clears throat> this is actually a true collaboration. Oh, they're all collaborations, but I feel like this one's a more true collaboration in which um, my mom's active of sewing becomes an act of drawing as well. And so what I did here was just really ask her to respond to what was already on the surface. And so what you, you see here is this kind of light blue um, ghost image of a, of a Olympic stadium in Ecuador. And so I just asked her to kind of respond to the drawing that I had made and just add something to it. And she had created these marks on there with a sewing machine that are indicators of movement in, in the line, I mean, movement of, the, of players, <clears throat> but also some of them are kind of movement of stars. And for me, this kind of uh, conflation of, of space has been really interesting too, how the, the movement of the player, the movement of people, um, can correspond to movement of stars. And this connection to pathfinding has been also uh, why I've been so connected to mapping in a way. <clears throat> because oftentimes these borders that we, we think about are so, I wouldn't say that they're fixated, but we think they're very clear in a way, like you're moving from one place to another and you're, you're crossing a boundary. And, these ideas, they kind of um, reiterate a certain type of binary. And that's something I've been trying to step away from in that 
it doesn't really serve a purpose to distinguish between one and the other, that there is this very complicated and abstract and very fragmented way of moving from one place to another, whether it be conceptually, physically, or even emotionally, you know? And so I think that's why a lot of the work results in this kind of abstract, <clears throat> this kind of abstract space. <clears throat> um, and yeah, I think a, so much of the mapping results in this, um, in these fields that are always in negotiation and really uh, wanting to showcase that now, because I think that's kind of where I kind of operate from and what I think my origin really uh, looks like. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much um, to all of you for sharing your, your thoughts and um, ideas with us. I think um, I just want to mention too that the, the coinciding of these exhibitions is um, it, happenstance. We didn't plan this at all. The fact that we um, are able to show a, kind of a, a breadth of Ronnie's work here and for then for her, Ronnie's work to be contextualized um, amongst a broader uh, history and present of um, Art of the Americas is um, really lucky. I don't know how, to, <laughs> how else to describe it. Um, it, that it worked out like this uh, and within an hour and a half of each other. So again, just really want to encourage you all um, to, to make that trip up. You know, I know I-25 is a, is a bear, but it's, I think this is really worth it <laughs> um, to see this exhibition. Um, so maybe we could just open, open it up to questions um, and maybe I'll start uh, with the first one to kick us off, but please um, feel free to jump in if you have questions you want to ask any of our panelists. Um, but in, in hearing Ronnie talk about the materials that he's using, and of course, you, many people who see the exhibition notice um, right away the, the kind of um, somewhat unusual materials that he's employing, he's thinking very carefully about in terms of uh, pattern paper, muslin, uh, but also gold leaf and, and thread that's sort of making its way into the conversation. Um, but I think also, you know, that's something that's, as I've been sort of living with this work, um, sitting with this work for the last few weeks, um, thinking increasingly about time as being an important component, um, an important material that Ronnie's also working with. And it's really it's interesting to hear Victoria and Jorge talk about the component of time in their exhibition. And I just wondered if you all could just chat a little bit more. You sort of talked about this being a really conscious decision to bring together um, objects from across different times into a conversation with one another. If you all could talk a little bit more about that or just even how like conceptions of time, you know, like the way we um, are trained as art historians and curators thinking about linear progression of time and and sort of breaking that up in exhibition space how how that might be challenged through even just working with those objects and especially given your different um, areas of expertise how that has informed um, your thinking around issues of time and exhibition making I uh, you know when when I first saw the work of Ronnie the Whitney. Um, and then we did a couple of studio visits and many conversations. And, you know, the artists tell you all these wonderful things that Ronnie have been telling us. And then we see different things as an art historian. And uh, I asked myself why I find this his body of work so interesting. And I was answering, he is disturbing the linearity of time using fragments of memories, fragments of personal memories and collective memory. And this is what makes so appealing this work. Because um, in a time that we consume things very fast and that the, the linear nature of time and the reversibility of time is pushing us every day, every second. 
you have this artist that is probably unconsciously questioning that and expanding his memory beyond the time of his life. Because uh, all these references to different historical moments and the, and the biography of his parents are part of this process. And uh, that aligns with our idea for the exhibition, that time can be disrupted and we can make lectures of a different nature if we disrupt the linearity of time. I don't know if you want to add something to that, Victoria. Yes, I think um, like what he's saying, and, and Ronnie has alluded to this, this idea of memory is, um, I think very powerful. Uh, I don't, I mean, we, many of you may already be familiar with the idea of the cyclical nature of time that, you know, predominates in the ancient world. And it's, it's things repeat over and over again, but every iteration is its own, right? So that idea of singularity in repetition somehow. Um, but I think the other thing that was very powerful to um, both of us and is very clear in your work, Ronnie, is the idea of memory. You know, we, we live in a world where ancient words continue to be part of our vocabulary and we don't even realize it. The word shark is the Maya word for shulk, right? Um, we use the word tamale, we use the word um, avocado, avocado comes from Nahuatl. You know, like there, there are all of these residual memories that are integrated into our present that we don't consciously think of. And artists are our interpreters, right? Um, they bring them to the surface in a way that many of us otherwise wouldn't see. There's another piece in the work. It's a video by Sandra Monterroso, who's, um, who's Maya. She's from Guatemala, but she's of Maya descent. And in the, in the piece, she's reciting a poem that she wrote for her lover and she's creating tortillas for him in this method that nobody uses anymore, but corn kernels have this very, very thick skin. And the only way to break it down is either through an acid or through physically breaking down the surface, the cellulose skin of the corn. And she's chewing it and spitting it out and creating a masa and creating tortilla in a way that her grandmother used to do. And we still have images of people doing tortillas in a way, in that way, from you know 900 from 400 CE, it's this idea that that there is this res this residue of the past that is reinterpreted and integrated somehow into our present. It's cyclical, but it's its own in some funny way. I mean, I find it interesting that the you know that we kind of walked into thinking about language too. And for me, growing up as a as a bilingual person in, in, in New York and what that meant, the idea of being bilingual is not, you know, myopic either, right? So it's like, there's this uh, notion of Spanglish and then there's notion of like other colloquialisms coming from someone who's Dominican or someone who's Puerto Rican and me growing up in that. And so like this notion of being, even being bilingual, being a very fluid kind of uh, development of one's identity, you know? It, it's in terms of like that itself kind of, it allows other big ideas of like time or culture or home to become just as fluid, you know? Because if, if language is this kind of very um, abstract notion, then it's almost everything else, right? And I think for me, it, it comes from a migrant experience, but also growing up in the Bronx, where like uh, multiculturalism is like a, a big part of like developing oneself in the, in that environment. Yeah, yeah, that's um, I'm really compelled by what you all are saying about time as as relating to this issue of not being static, right? Like, and that we have to sort of start thinking of these concepts and and, and culture, large like, or on a broader sense. Um, as being changing but connecting always, right, to to things and, and the past and the future, right, et cetera. Yeah. 
Um, so I have I have lots more questions, but I want to make sure to give um, the audience some time to to jump in and, and ask questions. Does anybody um, feel compelled? I know we have a mic, I think, in the back, and or we can pass this mic around. So please just pop up your hand. Hello. Um, so when I went to, I believe the one of the basketball court in the creek was called on the line. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So when I was on 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 the line experiencing that, I was thinking of um, being foul, being wronged, mm -hmm. and seeing the court, not knowing where to go after I'm wronged, and kind of wandering around the space and I think like as a basketball player you would want to go to the free throw line and that's programmed in us but I think if I was wrong and I was confused and I wouldn't know where to go I'd go as close to the crates as possible like as close to what I thought was real and my, my past my culture and I guess my question in all this is one like was that intentional and two um, what is it like conceptualizing this versus uh, like, like in your head when you're creating this versus um, walking in that space and um, kind of the dance between those things? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. I think um, we're almost entering a little, a little bit into the psychology of it. You know, this idea that you are stepping. I, I appreciate you saying that you like, I've been wrong, right? And then what does one do with that? emotion, that um, level of not understanding what to do, whether to deflect or whether to internalize or whether to attack, it almost kind of steps into this like, um, uh, what am I, what's the term I'm looking for? Like you uh, freeze, you f fight or flee, right? Or freeze, right? And I think a lot of these, initial and some even up until now this like marking of the space <clears throat> is to just allow that to be the case and i think oftentimes when you're presented with with um these um questions of self you're you're being asked to figure it out right away right you're, you're being asked to like have an understanding of your position, the other person's position and the outcome. And I think what I've been trying to do with these installations is just to allow a space of contemplation, a space of, of meditation potentially, because those things aren't really often offered to us, right? Because you're, you're just basically going back and forth between one place and another. And I think it's okay for there to just be a place in which you're just kind of allowing the thing to be awkward or, you know, um, abstract and fragmented. Yeah. I was just informed we have time for only one more question. There's another audience question. Hi. Um, We've been talking a lot about like lines as like movement and time and representation of uh, like players moving and like the sewing. Um, is that for you like a way to communicate or like do you see yourself? Not that like lines are bad, but like the linear, like they're kind of, you know, colonial in a way with like, the border and time. Like, is do you see yourself moving away from that or just like exploring it and reinventing it? I don't know if it's really a question, but just kind of thinking about all yeah. that. Um, I think, you know, what Jorge was saying about like, the work trying to disrupt our uh, conditioning sometimes or even our understanding of, of time and, and um, the function of linearity um, is something that I'm really interested in. I think um, there's moments in which the use of, of rules is really interesting to me because it's a collective understanding of what is a rule, right? And then once 
you disrupt that, you are considered an outlier or there are enough people to kind of give you agency again. So um, I think disruption is a really big part of it, you know? Um, and then within that disruption, allowing, again, that space to stay within it, to figure it out, because it's, um, yeah, I think it's it's important that the 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 disruption have time to coalesce and potentially turn into something else, but not always. You know, um, I hope that answers a little bit your question. Great. Well, thank you so much you. Um, to all of our panels. Thank you all for coming out. We're really grateful. Um, for you to share your thoughts with us and, and spend time with us. Um, please join me in just giving another big thank you to Ronnie, Jorge, and Victoria for joining us. Today.